you've drank something that maybe is just stagnant. You, you were thinking it was going to be a hot, a hot tea or a cold tea. And it's right in the middle of it. Just, it, it just turns your stomach. Well, let me tell you something I think is interesting. Lukewarm Christians believe that Christians should be excited about Jesus. They believe that. <clears throat> but they don't believe it too much. Now, w- give me just a couple more minutes. I'll be done. Listen. Lukewarm Christians, they believe that you should pray, but not too much. Lukewarm Christians believe that you should read the Word, but not too much. Lukewarm Christians believe you need to go to church, but not too much. Lukewarm Christians believe you need to give in the offering, but not too much. Lukewarm Christians believe you need a witness, but not too much. Lukewarm Christians believe you should fight against the evil in our nation, but not too much. They believe you should fast, but not too much. They believe you should worship the Lord, but not too much. They believe you should sing praises, but not too much. They believe you should seek the Lord, but not too much. They believe you should sacrifice, but not too much. They believe you should live holy, but not too much. They believe you should support missions, but not too much. They believe you should have standards, but not too much. They believe you should want revival, but not too much. You want to tell you the reason why? Because they're neither hot nor cold. They're kind of in the middle. They're they're kind of balanced. Are you seeing what I'm trying to say here? here? Here's the dilemma that we're in. Sadly, this church had nothing in it that Jesus could say anything at all good about. Nothing. This is a church that needs a lesson on real riches clean garments and healed eyes. Their poverty is obvious, the garments are stained, and their vision is bad. And with that all being said, he says, and this is the clincher, I am outside of your church. I I can't believe it. You are going on with your services and your programs without me. I am the one who got this started. I'm Jesus. Remember, I'm the one that died for your sins. I'm outside. That's why, folks, this is such a shocker. And yet, here's the deal. He says, if you would open the door, that's all you need to do. I'll come in and we can get close again. Now, (coughs) your assignment for tomorrow is going to be this. I'd like for you to read Revelation 4 and 5. And um, you're going to see something tomorrow night that I think is going to be really interesting. And I want you to take special note of this. I want you to see if you can figure out who is the main focus of these chapters. And ask yourself, and this is not going to be real complicated. I'm just giving you two things I want you to do here. And ask if our worship is going to be any different when we get to the throne room of heaven. And I have to tell you, of all the stuff that I've studied and prepared for tomorrow night, I'd have to say is the most exciting, the most impacting personally of anything I've ever read in Revelation. This is absolutely phenomenal. I don't want you to miss tomorrow night. And then I want you to take note of these four bizarre creatures. You, you don't, maybe if you've never read four or five yet, you, you'll, you're going to be introduced real quickly to four bizarre creatures. And they're actually right now around the throne of God. And I want you to take notice of them because they're a little different than what Ezekiel. Now, if you have a reference Bible, you want to go to Isaiah 6 and Ezekiel 1, and it'll give you some references to these other creatures. <clears throat> By the way, when you get to heaven, Everything's not going to look like you and me. You might as well get used to that because there's going to be things that you and I are totally dumbfounded by. Now, once we get to this point, see, because up to there, here, we've had things that you have seen, the things that are, and starting tomorrow night, we're going to talk about the things that are going to be hereafter. Remember that? We're, the things that are going to be hereafter, starting in chapter 4. And the thing that's going to start us off And you're going to see this, is that it says, after this, the word after this is the exact same word 
That's the things which shall be hereafter. That exact same Greek word is what this Greek word is here. It's the word metatata, the Greek word. It means hereafter. So up to this point, everything we've seen, everything we're seeing right now is current. But starting here, we're going to start off, and the first thing that John sees is an open door. And he hears a voice of a trumpet that says, come up here. What's that all about, and where is that going to lead us, and what's going to be the next thing to happen? I'm going to tell you something. I am, I'm, I am certain that when you see this tomorrow night, you are going to be so blessed and so challenged by it because I got news for you. Our coordination day in heaven could be tomorrow night. And what we are being told about in this, this passage is the most thrilling thing. It makes me want to just get closer to him. Now, with that in mind, let's close. <clears throat> Lord, I just want to thank you for my dear friends coming and spending these two hours together. I ask that you'll bless them as your word said you would because you said if we would read and if we would hear and keep these words that you would bless us. And I pray that will become reality in the life of every single person in this building tonight. I ask these things in Jesus' name and I thank you for it.